The world's oceans are a treacherous place for many organisms, with danger and peril at every turn. To combat this, a wide variety of different techniques and weapons have been adapted to help these vulnerable creatures survive in this truly cruel and harsh marine world. Claws or jelly pads are widely used by members of the class Decapoda, yet the strength, size and power of these claws varies massively. Although they may seem like quite intricate mechanisms, they are actually just simple pinching devices which have evolved from the decapod's legs. The claws are formed from the dactyl and the propus, which are the last two segments of the legs. The dactyl is the moving part of the claw, which moves against the propus. The tendons that control this movement, the apodemes, are located in the propus. The largest of these tendons governs the closing motion of the dactyl, allowing the claws to apply huge amounts of force. The claws are aided by the hard protective exoskeleton of the decapod, which is made mainly of the protein chitin, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate. One of the heavyweights of the claw world is the common lobster, Homerus gammarus, found in the eastern Atlantic Ocean. The claws of this creature can apply a massive 58 pounds per square inch, but the true champion has to be the edible crab, Cancerus pigurus, which can apply up to 90 pounds of pressure per square inch. We do agree that this is a slightly cruel but very inappropriate video of someone obviously just bothering a crab in shallow waters, yet it does beautifully show the crab using its claws as a defence mechanism, swinging them wildly in defence as it retreats backwards away from its potential predator. Camouflage has to be the first line of defence for any animal, as staying out of sight of predators can avoid the need for any kind of defence mechanisms. The true king of camouflage has to be the common octopus, or octopus vulgaris. This mollusk has the ability to completely change its appearance. Its skin is covered in specialised groups of cells collectively called chromatophore organs. Each of these organs contains one chromatophore cell and multiple nerve, muscle and glial cells. The central chromatophore cell is surrounded by between 4 to 24 radially arranged muscle cells with their associated nerve and glial cells. These cells are connected to the pigment sac, which is known as the cytoelastic sacculus. As these contract around the sac, they increase its area up to 50 times. All of these chromatophores working in complete unison allow the octopus to create such vivid colours. Should this camouflage fail, the octopus has another trick up its sleeve. It ejects an ink which contains large amounts of the skin pigment melanin, which inhibits the vision of the potential predator. It has also been found to contain small amounts of the enzyme tyrosinase and the amino acids aspartic acid, glutamic acid and alanine, which could disable the chemosensory abilities of the predator. This would give the octopus precious seconds that it uses its hyponome to make a swift getaway. The undulate is perfectly adapted for survival in the sandy and muddy sublitoral zones of Britain and Europe. Rays are members of the subclass Elasmobranchi, which belong to sharks, rays and skates. Rays separated from sharks around 200 million years ago and developed wide flat bodies. This flat profile allows the ray to bury itself under a thin layer of substrate and the black lines and white spots break up the shape of the ray from above to make visual identification by predators very difficult. The ray can use its mechanosensory system, the lateral line, to detect potential predators whilst it lays motionless under the substrate. The lateral line is a line of pores, usually running down each side of the fish, whereas the ray has evolved in such a way that these lines run down its dorsal side. These pores open into a tube system lying just under the surface of the skin. These tubes are filled with liquid and lined with cells that have special hair-like projections called cilia. Fish use these cilia to detect motion in the water. When the water moves, it pushes the water in the tubes, which in turn moves the cilia. When the cilia bend, the cells turn the mechanical signal into an electrical signal that can be sent to the brain via neurons. This allows the ray to detect movement of potential predators above. The lionfish, Taurus Fultons, may be graceful and beautiful, but don't let this fool you. It packs a huge punch in the defence stakes. The spines along the dorsal side contain a venom which blocks the function of acetylcholine sterase and thus causes excessive acetylcholine to accumulate in the synaptic cleft. The excess acetylcholine causes uncontrollable muscle contraction throughout the entire body, leading to death by asphyxiation. Porcupine fish have the ability to inflate their body by swallowing water or air. 
thereby becoming rounder. This increase in size reduces the range of potential predators to those with much bigger mouths. A second defense mechanism is provided by the sharp spines, which radiate outwards when the fish is inflated. Some species are poisonous, having a tetrodoxin. Porcupine fish are of the family, Diodontidae, also commonly called blowfish and globefish. Porcupine fish are medium to large sized fish and are found in shallow, temperate, and tropical seas worldwide. A few species are found much further out from shore, wherein large shoals of thousands of individuals can occur. They're generally slow. Their defense mechanism is provided by the sharp spines, which radiate outwards when the fish is inflated. Some species are poisonous, having a tetradoxin in their internal organs, such as the ovaries and liver. The next defense mechanism is counterintuitive, as it is mainly used by predators and not prey, but can still be utilized in a life or death situation. That mechanism is, of course, teeth. The sandbar shark, like most sharks, has several rows of teeth. These teeth are modified placoid scales from the skin of the shark. The teeth are not anchored to the jawbone and gradually grow out over time. As these teeth grow out, they are replaced by other rows of teeth, and sharks can have up to 30,000 teeth in a lifetime. The large jaws of the green moray will readily display its formidable defense system, a huge sharp set of teeth. This large and nocturnal animal rests inside holes on the reef, leaving only its formidable jaws protruding, which would be enough to make even the biggest, most hardy of predators think twice about tackling this large eight-foot eel. Not really sure of its relevance, but here's the standard footage of any self-respecting wildlife documentary. The epic yet slightly overused clip of a great white shark tackling a seal in a bid to stun it. Yep, completely irrelevant, but that fact is far outweighed by the sheer chipanzo awesomeness of the clip. The spiny spider crab has a large spiny shell made from the protein chitin, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate, making it virtually impenetrable to many different types of predators. Nicknamed the living fossil, the horseshoe crab has remained relatively unchanged for many millions of years. This is probably due to its large calcareous shell which surrounds the animal, literally encapsulating it completely, making it very hard for any predator to get access to it from the sides or above once it anchors itself into the substrate. Look at the turtle, the beautiful turtle. Look at him there, he's swimming, he's swimming so free. <laughs> the shell of a sea turtle starts to form early on in its embryonic development. Rather than bending round to form the rib cage, a sea turtle's ribs actually bend outwards to form the oval framework of the carapace. And then the carapace is formed from a calcified tissue deep in the skin at the back. This hardened layer is actually known as dermal bone and eventually will fill the gaps between the ribs. There are three main types of symbiosis. There's mutualism, when both species involve benefit. There's commensalism, when one species benefits but the other one isn't affected. And then there's parasitism, when one species benefits and the other is exploited and harmed in the process. This is an example of mutualism between a watchman goby and a blind shrimp. The shrimp can dig a burrow into the substrate. And within this burrow, it is safe, but outside of the burrow, it is vulnerable due to its poor vision. This is where the watchman goby comes in. That can sit there and alert the shrimp to predators, allowing them both to dart to safety. They both benefit because the shrimp is alerted to predators and the goby gets a burrow. This is a boxer crab holding an anemone in each one of its chelae. The stinging tentacles of the anemone allow the crab to pack an extra punch, whereas the anemones benefit themselves by being wafted around in the water column, as you can see. This allows them to pick up extra food and extra nutrients. This is the barracuda being cleaned by several cleaner rats. The cleaner rats enter the barracuda's mouth and clean round its gills and round its teeth. Both species benefit as the cleaner rats get some food and the barracuda has any bits of undigested food removed from these areas. Finally, the last type of symbiosis is mimicry, displayed here by the mimic octopus, which is known to imitate over 16 other species. Here it is mimicking a mantis shrimp, a cowrie shell, 
a large tropical starfish, a flatfish, a stingray, and a banded sea crate. 